Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Genith monthly webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Aligning Your Values with Your Investments. We'll get started in a few minutes, so go grab a coffee. We're just waiting for a few people to log on. We will start promptly in two minutes. Okay, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thanks very much for spending some time with us. My name is Ian Lusher. I am a partner and portfolio manager at Genesis Capital Management. I will be your honored host for today's session. And with me is my colleague, Mike Thiessen, Chief Sustainability Officer and also a partner at Genesis. Links have been added to both our LinkedIn profiles in the chat section if you'd like to connect with either of us after the session. Today, Mike and I will be talking about how to align your values with your investment. This is something that most people, when we ask them, are very interested in doing, but it's kind of a daunting task to figure this out on your own. So today, we're going to cover exactly how to do so. Strategies to help identify yours and your family's values, how to assure investments align with those values, and maybe most importantly, understanding and measuring your investments impact over time. Uh, while we're waiting for a few more people to log on, a few housekeeping items. For best viewing experience, it's best to maximize that screen. You'll notice that there's a chat to your right. The chat section you can use to ask any questions. We're going to have a question and answer session at the end of the slide period. Uh, so please put your questions in the chat. And if you're having any technical troubles, uh, let us know in the chat as well. We have people that are there to help you. We also have um, a great solution for you. Uh, shockingly enough, if you hop off and come back on, generally any issue that you're having, be it video problem or audio troubles, will disappear. So that would be your troubleshoot. I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement, extending my gratitude to the Indigenous peoples, specifically Coast Salish, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam, whose lands we are honored to speak with you today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Canada is home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to meet and work on this territory. Okay, let's get started. So the agenda for today is we're going to look at kind of three main areas. I'm gonna cover the first two, Mike's gonna cover the third. I'm going through determining your values, aligning your investments, and Mike will have dive into his specialty, which is measuring your impact. Okay, so, you know, why are we even talking about this? Why is, in, why is it important to align your values with your investments? This isn't even a question that we asked you know, 20 plus years ago, I'm aging myself, but when I started in the industry, we didn't even talk about this. I've worked with multiple global and large Canadian financial institutions and these types of questions never even came up in our meetings about how to things to ask clients, but it actually is something that's evolved today and something that's top of mind. So a main reason that it's so important is because if you align your values with your investments, you're obviously just gonna be more vested in it. You're gonna have a deeper understanding of what you own. And why are you gonna have a deeper understanding of what you own? It's because you're actually interested in those things. They're important to you. So you're much more likely to spend more time getting to know what's in your portfolio. And through that, you're gonna have a better idea of where it's going. So, Essentially, when you align your values with your investments, you just become a better investor. That's the bottom line. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna go over four key steps to creating a values action plan. I'm not gonna read them all because we're gonna go through them in depth, um, but we really need to 
get down to what your core values are. Sounds easy. It isn't that easy. I'm going to go through a few steps on how to actually um, come up with what your core values are and identifying your top concerns within those broad values and not forgetting about the big financial questions. So what are your goals? Why are you invested in the first place, right? You have to make sure that um, through all of this exercise, you're still creating a plan that actually fulfills the goals and your actual need for this, this investment. And then four, you know, how to work with a portfolio manager, be it someone at Genis who you're working with today, or if you're with another financial institution, you should be talking to your portfolio manager to create an action plan. Okay, so getting clear on your values. This is actually a lot harder than you may think. Um, we, I talk to a lot of clients. I often ask them, you know, what's important to you? And sometimes there's a blank stare. Sometimes they know right away. Some people have gone through this um, exercise before. But the point is, is values, the key point here, before we go into how to figure it out, is values are something that's personal. It's a personal choice. Um, your portfolio manager shouldn't be telling you what your value should be. It should be the other way around. So we want to design a portfolio that reflects what's important to you. So I was trying to think of, you know, the last couple of weeks we've been going through this presentation and I was trying to think, you know, how can I give you some examples of some people that you may know that have very clear, concise values? And uh, it's very clear in their investment choices that there's something that's very important to them. There's a core value. And so I started thinking about Shark Tank, um, you know, Dragon's Den, Shark Tank. These shows are, you know, somewhat famous investors that um, get pitched ideas and companies and then they obviously invest in them or they're not. So, you know, three sharks, uh, Canada's own Kevin O'Leary, also known as Mr. Wonderful. What does he love? Cash flow, right? Whenever he does a deal, he puts in some sort of a royalty. He's kind of famous for this. So, you know, his value, what's important to him is to invest in companies that create a cash flow. Uh, Lori Grenier, who's the queen of QBC, she likes investments in companies that innovate. They have products. And number one, they hold a patent. She loves companies that have proprietary um, ownership of their product and they own a patent. And number three, sometimes he's a guest on Shark Tank, uh, Daniel Lebetsky, who is the founder of Kind. Um, if that doesn't ring a bell right away, they sell delicious granola bars and various treats that you usually can find right in front of your face in the Starbuck aisle. Um, basically, Daniel Lebetsky, he only looks at buying companies or investing with companies that uh, use their business as a vehicle to push social change. So those are three, you know, sharks, very different. Their values are their own and they're very obvious. Graham here is going to put a question in the chat to see what, uh, if any of you have a defined value, if there's anything that you in particular look for in an investment. Nobody's answering so far. This is why we need to talk about these things and how to, uh, how to define what your, what your values are. It's different for everyone. There we go. Thanks. Um, you know, growth, sustainability. Uh, myself, I like innovation and FinTech. Preserving capital. These are all impact. Excellent. Yeah. These are all values. Now it's coming. It only takes one and then they come. Yeah, so growth, you know, uh, encouraging environmentally friendly products. These are all values, right? And so how do you come across these? How do you come across these values? How do you figure out what's important to you? Well, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can basically sit at a table with your spouse and your family and um, you can 
kind of just brainstorm, you know, what, what's important to you? What, what, what is a, uh, what is a value? What is, what do you value most from your investments? What do you, what are you looking for? Are you looking to create impact in a certain area? You can just brainstorm with a piece of paper. It's actually very difficult sometimes to do that, uh, to kind of articulate it, to have it top of mind. So there's tools out there like reweaving wealth. You'll see the picture on the, on the, on the slide there. Um, it's kind of like a game. They try to make it like a game, but it's a kind of a fun uh, way of trying to explore what your values are um, and what um, is important to you by using cards. And it's you know kind of game-like, but you can do this with your spouse again, you can do this with your family, but what it really does is um, it's just a guide. It guides you, it's more structured. So it's much easier for you to um, maybe come up you probably know them somewhere in your head exactly what's most important, but maybe you just need to read and go through a few cards to really narrow it down. And then you kind of come up with some, some different things here, right? And essentially, it doesn't matter what you use as a tool. It doesn't matter how you get to it. The important thing is just to have a clear, concise and way of articulating what's important to you with your investments, where they're going, and what your core values are when in terms of investments. Okay, identifying your concerns. So really all this is, is you've come up with a broad topic. You have obviously have your core values. Mind match what's on the screen there. You have your core values, um, but you need to drill that down, right? So there may be, um, these broad categories, but you actually are more interested in certain areas of each. And so again, you could do this through just brainstorming and talking, or maybe it just comes through life experience, your work experience, that there's certain things that really resonate with you. So you want to go in that area. You can also use reweaving wealth does this as well with the cards, um, where it kind of has broader topics and then lists more things just to think about. And so you need to um, do this to try to narrow down what's really important to you. So you may say that you really, you know, leadership is important to you, who runs the company is important to you, diversity is important to you, but perhaps it's diversity of thought, maybe it's diversity of boards, yeah, maybe it's gender diversity. You can narrow that down to whatever is most important to you. Um, same with innovation. There may be, I like fintech, I like financial tech, um, but other people really look at alternative energies and that's where they want to be focused. So you can narrow that down in, under a broad tech category just to get things more articulated for yourself. Okay, answering the big financial questions. This is the tough one. And the reason is this is where we used to start, right? So we used to always start with what are your goals? Where are you going with this? What would you like to do with this money? What do you have um, planned for this money? Where are you headed? Um, so you also need to understand these, right? So this is where we often look at things like um, time horizon income needs, risk tolerance, return potential. And so why this is important and why this fuels into um, how you want the portfolio to look going forward in terms of values and, and concerns is sometimes there's a mismatch, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, say you, you know, really believe in alternative energy companies and um, that's your core focus. That's where you'd like to have a lot of your money. That's where you'd like to create some impact. Um, but your time horizon is very short and you have high income needs. So there has to be a bit of a balance there. We have to balance your values, what you want in a portfolio, but make sure that it actually matches with your goals. Obviously, a lot of alternative energy companies don't create cash flow. A lot of them... Um, at times can be uh, more volatile. Um, and a lot of them are more longer term looking. So we need to take it in, into consideration your financial objectives as well and try to mesh them all together 
um, to get a portfolio that you're confident in, that you believe in, that you're in sync with. So I believe Graham is going to put a poll up here. Here we go. Please take some time to answer this poll. Oh, excellent. Lots of answers. Okay. So uh, the question is, you know, have you worked with a portfolio manager or consultant to determine your investment values? Um, I'm actually not totally surprised here because I'm, I'm quite sure there's some Genesis, um, Genesis clients here. Um, so 58 of you are saying yes, but what's even more um, positive is that um, 20% of you haven't, but plan to. So whether you're dealing with Janice and you have a Janice portfolio manager or you're with another financial institution, you should be having this talk with your portfolio manager. It's very important. Um, as I said previously, you have to look at in here, you see the, you see these three circles, the green, the, the blue and the purple. Um, and the reality is, is we want to define our core values. We want to know, uh, we want to have some input into the impact that our investments will provide going forward. Um, but we also want to put that in the context of your own financial situation and um, what your understanding is, what your expectations are for returns, what your goals are. And um, in the middle there, you see what your, what your customized investment solution is. And the main thing when you're talking to your portfolio manager is there's got to be a little bit of compromise because as you can see, there's multiple areas where they may not actually all match together. So the job of the portfolio manager is to try to have a portfolio that you're comfortable with that will touch all three buttons, impact, alignment, and achieving your financial goals and create a customized investment solution that you can kind of be proud of and you're probably more likely to stick with going forward. With that, so I've gone through determining your values, I've gone through aligning your investments, and now I'm gonna pass it over to my esteemed colleague here, Mike, to go through measuring impact. Great, thanks Ian. So measuring impact. Um, so now that we've identified um, our values um, and started creating our action plan, uh, we need to look into measurement. Um, and so we're all familiar with measuring our financial progress, making sure our progress is matching our expectations and, and our needs there. Uh, but we also need to be measuring our impact and, and seeing if our impact is also um, living up to our expectations as well. Um, so there are many ways to measure impact, um, and some of them are very complex, which, which can be great for certain types of investors that really want to dive into the details and, and go through um, pages of reports. But we found that um, most of our clients, most investors want something that's a little bit easier to use. Um, they want something that is... Um, that is, is simpler, that something that they can kind of check their portfolio and, and make sure that they're progressing over time and just making sure that their portfolio overall is, is meeting their expectations in, in a quick way. Uh, and they can compare between portfolios too. So we've actually created a net impact score in order to do this. And so the net impact score takes into account the positive impact that you have, um, the negative impact that you have, and then creates a net score. Um, so we can get more into the details here. So the net impact score uh, is based on the United Nations Sus Sustainable Development Goals. So these are 17 goals um, that were confirmed by the UN in 2015, and they range from things like good health and well-being, quality education, uh, reducing inequalities, climate action. So when we're looking at positive impact, we're looking at how much are we contributing to at least one of the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. 
Um, so when we're looking at a stock or a company to invest in, we're looking at the percentage of revenue that that company is generating that's coming from a product or service that contributes towards one of these goals. So for example, if we're looking into a software company, maybe 80% of a company's revenue, uh, of that software company's revenue is coming from an educational product. So then we would label that as an 80% positive impact investment because 80% of its revenue is contributing towards at least a, one of these goals. There could be other companies that maybe have five or 10% of their revenue is contributing towards one of these goals. So their uh, positive impact would be five or 10%. And we do the same thing actually on the negative side, but, uh, but in, in an opposite way. So we look at what percentage of revenue is detracting from one of these goals. So if you're investing in a tobacco company, uh, maybe maybe that's 90% of their revenue is coming from tobacco, then that would be a 90% negative investment because it's detracting from uh, sustainable development goal number three, so good health and well-being. And there could be companies that are a mix of those two. So here are just a few examples of some companies and their net impact scores. Um, so first we have Vestas Wind um, that we have been invested in uh, in our impact portfolio at certain times throughout the year. Um, and so Vestas Wind, they um, design, they manufacture, they construct wind, turbine, wind turbines around the world. So 100% of their revenue is contributing towards clean and affordable energy, which is a sustainable development goal. So it has 100% positive impact. Um, and then it has no negative impact. And so it's net impact, which is positive minus negative, um, is 100% is as well. And then there's other companies. So for example, here like Synovus Energy, which is very carbon intensive. So it would actually be detracting from the Climate Action Sustainable Development Goal. Um, so it has 100% um, negative impact. And so its net impact would be minus 100. And then you could also have some companies that are a mix of the two. Um, so examples here, we have Nestle, we have Excel Energy. So Nestle has um, some of its revenue coming from nutritious products. So it's contributing towards health and well-being, but then it also has a lot of junk food. Um, so then that's detracting from health and well-being. So um, in, in the end, it has a net score that is a negative net impact. And then we have uh, Excel Energy that does have renewable energy, uh, but then it also has carbon intensive energy. Um, so it has a slightly negative net impact uh, when you look at, at uh, both of these types of revenue that it's generating. And then we can also get a net impact score for a fund. Um, so we can take the weighted average of all of the companies within that fund. Uh, we can take the weighted average of their positive impact, their negative impact, and their net impact. And then we can get uh, scores for that fund. So you can see here for our fossil free can globe and fossil free dividend funds, um, the net impact is between seven and 10% for positive impact um, and for net impact. Um, and the negative impact for both of these is zero uh, because we're making sure that we're not investing in anything that's taking away from a sustainable development goal uh, within these funds. Um, so their, yeah, so their net impact is same as positive. And then if you look at their benchmark, which is a mix of the TSX and MSCI world indexes, um, there is quite a lot of positive impact. So about 10% on average positive impact within that benchmark, uh, but then about 10% negative impact. So the, the benchmark does have some tobacco in it. It does have you know carbon intensive industries, um, uh, junk food, things like that. Um, and then so its overall net impact is about zero. So you can see that our funds um, have quite a bit more impact when we look at net impact um, than their benchmarks. And then we can even go further into um, impact investing um, with our fossil free high impact equity fund. So this is a fund where we're trying to, we're striving to beat the benchmark financially, but then we're also trying to have significantly higher positive impact and net impact than the benchmark. So you can see here that the positive impact is 51.6. That means on average in that fund, um, companies are making about half of their revenue from impactful sources. So renewable energy, um, it could be healthcare solutions, education, energy efficiency. Um, we have 0% negative impact. Uh, and then so the net impact is 51.6 and that's versus its benchmark of 3.1%. Uh, so 
far, far more uh, impact um, in a net impact sense than its benchmark. And so that's that's our net impact score. Um, certainly ask questions uh, if you have any more questions around this. So the next section is who you work with matters. Uh, we all know that people are caring more and more about the products that they're buying, uh, the services that they're that they're paying for, and the companies that are behind those products or services, and and what they're doing, who they are, and you know what the values are of those companies. So we thought it would be great to share a bit more about Genesis um, and what we're doing. So first of all, um, diversity. Um, so diversity is something that's very important to Genesis, um, and we do have a very diverse company. You can see in terms of employees, the leadership, shareholders, um, we're very diverse, and we we find that this is able to it helps us to better serve our clients, um, and it helps us to be more innovative. Uh, we have more diversity of thought. We're able to be pioneers uh, in certain areas, uh, whereas other companies aren't able to do that. Um, and, and we think that we're better able to serve our community as well. Genesis is also a certified B Corp. And so this means that we're striving to be a force for good in society. Um, so not just worrying about the bottom line, but also having other values that are helping society, helping the environment. So being a certified B Corp is similar to, you know, a coffee brand being a fair trade or a, a real estate or building being an LED or a lead certified, I mean, uh, building. So we're a certified B Corp. And when you become a certified B Corp, you have to uh, pass rigorous testing. You have to have a score beyond a certain level. When we first became a B Corp, we had a score of 88. Uh, and that's a good score. It, it, it enables you to be a certified B Corp. Um, and the scoring is based on um, based on your mission as a firm, the products that you're selling. Uh, it looks at your employee base. So um, what, what's the compensation like? Uh, what's the diversity? Um, looks at leadership, looks at shareholder composition. Um, and so our score actually has increased from 88 to 121 this year. Um, and so actually with that 121 score, we're, we actually have the highest score uh, in Canada for investment advisor firms. Um, so we're quite happy with that. And we've also had other recognition along our sustainability too. So before we move into Q&A, uh, we do have a values challenge. Um, so we wanted everyone to be able to take your next step, uh, kind of get the ball rolling. Um, so this challenge, uh, which applies to about 40% of people in the seminar, uh, is to talk to your uh, portfolio manager, your financial advisor, that could be someone at Genesis, it could be someone outside of Genesis, um, and, and tell them about the values that you've identified. Um, and, then, and then start on making an action plan. Um, so ask what options you have. Uh, for investing that would align with your values. So it looks like 62% of people have already done that. So good job, you're, you've already you know, done the challenge. But for the other 40% that plan to or haven't yet, um, this is the challenge for you, um, is to start talking to your portfolio manager and get the ball rolling there. And if you have you know, any questions about how to do this, what questions to bring up with the portfolio manager, definitely reach out to anyone at Genesis, including Ian and I, and we'd be happy to help. Now on to the Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to host the Q&A, uh, mainly because I think that Mike is going to be on the hot seat for a lot of these questions, to be honest. Um, first, I just was reading in the chat, Mike, and uh, Sue was asking, could you kind of go into a little bit of where we get the scoring from, who we use to come up with sure um, so at genesis we take in we take in a lot of data since we're a quantitative firm um, on the financial side we take in a lot of data and um, for sustainability and impact we have a lot of data providers our main data providers are msci esg research and impact cubed um, on the impact side we also uh, work with sustainalytics as well um, and, and other data providers too. Um, so, but those, those are the core ones. Um, so they're independent firms that, that rank companies based on the revenue that's generated that's uh, from products or services that contribute towards a sustainable development goal. So uh, it's an independent body that is, that is deciding this for us. And then we put it into our, our models, into our score. Clarifies. I know a few people were talking about that in the chat. 
So um, Carol had a question. How do you approach this subject with your financial advisor or your portfolio manager? Uh, the, the subject of identifying values or the, the or, aligning your values. Yeah. And probably values. both aligning your values and how do you measure it? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that um, I think just just talking about your values. Um, so, so just telling them what what's important to you, um, telling them, um, you know, maybe you can bring out um, some of those exercises that you had talked about. So that uh, was it reinventing wealth. Um, Ian, that you were discussing before, um, uh, reweaving wealth. Reweaving wealth. Um, so you could, um, yeah, you could bring out things like that. Um, I think uh, I, I've seen people bring out the sustainable development goals and and share with their portfolio managers the sustainable development goals that are really meaningful for them. Um, so that could be another route. Uh, and then in terms of impact, um, if you want to talk to us about using the net impact score, if you're with Genis, then you're already using that score, you'll get it in your financial statements. Um, uh, but if you if you want to use it and you're not with Genis, then certainly talk to us. And there's other impact measurement tools out there as well that are typically more complex. So there's things like the impact uh, management project. Uh, there's things like the common approach. Uh, and there's there's many more, many more impact measurement approaches, but they're just much more complex. You need to be your own advocate in some respects, and that's um, you know the best way to approach the topic is to bring it up. I think um, just be upfront that there's some certain things that you'd actually really like to have in your portfolio, and just see if it's a possibility. Okay, one very interesting question here. Um, we're going to try to get to all of these. Why would an ONG company have such a high negative impact? when the energy produced has very positive impact on the pr products that we currently need and the energy we need for transportation and HVAC? Mm. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really interesting question. It's, um, I, I agree that we, that we're not yet at a point where we could just shut off oil and gas and, uh, and live off of renewables or anything like that yet. It, we haven't come to that stage yet. So, it's still needed, uh, but I think we need to continue to transition towards a lower carbon economy. Um, so in terms of the impact scoring methodology or the impact measurement, uh, we're measuring how much um, each of those, each of the company's products are contributing or detracting from a sustainable development goal. So um, two of the sustainable development goals in there um, are related to this. So one is clean and affordable energy. Um, so it wouldn't fit that one. And then another one is climate action. Um, and so if, if we're burning, uh, more fossil fuels, then we're, then we're detracting from the climate action sustainable development goal. Um, I know this isn't perfect. Of course, there is value in, you know, keeping our lights on, keeping our hospitals running, schools running, things like that. Uh, but I think we, we more just need to focus on, um, on possibly investing in companies that are that are helping us transition to that next stage where we where we don't need to be relying on fossil fuels that are carbon intensive. Um, quick question that I can answer very quickly. Uh, there was a question about the board game, and it was you know is this a real product or is it just a fancy graphic? <laughs> and uh, it actually is a real thing. Uh, we're going to provide that link in an email, I believe, if you were interested in it. Uh, nothing affiliated with us. It just is a tool that um, we have used um, for this and, and clients have used. Uh, another question. Uh, let me see here. This is another good one. Oh, okay. Uh, how do you come with the percentages for impact score in an objective way? That's a very good question. You know, are, you know, are, our, are, are our impact scores objective and how do we kind of prove that? Hmm. Yeah. So I think, I think it's important to go through a, a third party an independent party. Um, so this isn't us that is in Genesis that is deciding, um, which company has, um, has revenue coming from a certain area. Um, it's, it's an independent company, um, that is, that is figuring that out and, and basically they're figuring it out by looking through the company's revenues and, and also looking at the sustainable development goals 
and deciding um, is this portion of the revenue contributing or detracting from a sustainable development goal or is it just neutral? Um, so there might be some sources of revenue that, that are more neutral. Um, and, and so I don't think that when you're deciding if something can be um, contributing or detracting from a sustainable development goal, that you can be completely objective because you know there's going to be opinions on whether certain um, certain products are contributing or not. Uh, but I think we're doing the the best we can with having an independent company do that for us. Um, and we've looked through their methodology in detail, and and it is quite solid. Um, so that's the best best answer for that one. Okay. Uh, we had another question. How do you determine the per percentage distribution for the benchmark? So, for example, she says in one slide, it's 25% S&P TSX, 75% MSCI. Then in the next slide, the benchmark is 100% MSCI. So how do we come about that? Yeah, so when we're creating a fund or creating a portfolio, then we set up the benchmark for that fund or portfolio. So. For our fossil-free can globe and fossil-free dividend funds, um, the the benchmark is different from our impact fund. Um, so for those funds, it's 25% TSX, 75% MSCI World, um, and that's what we've um, heard from clients that that uh, that's the benchmark that they want to be measuring against. Uh, and then when it comes to impact, um, we found that uh, just a purely global benchmark has been better uh, for for that fund. Impact pool um there isn't much canadian representation so we want the benchmark to be to accurately reflect um the pool of investments that we're um uh, buying on behalf of clients okay this one's a tough one because mm -hmm. um i always think about this when we talk about values what if you have a very specific value so vicky writes her question is um, if my key value is protection of wildlife habitat, how would I know if my portfolio was consistent with this? Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's quite difficult when it's very specific. Um, I, I think it's great to have very specific goals. Um, there are there are certain values that that you're not going to be able to, or it's going to be very difficult to accomplish through things like public equities. Um, so a lot of our clients will do uh, will do private impact investments, and we have that service available uh, where you're investing in in funds or in products that are uh, private equity or venture capital or um, uh, real estate infrastructure. And for those ones, you can you can uh, become a bit more specific um, with the with your impact that you're wanting to make. Um, but within kind of a public equity portfolio, something that's a bit more general, um, you can, um, you know, you can definitely look into the companies that are in the portfolio and, and see if any of these companies would be contributing or taking away from, from your goal. Um, you can also see that if the kind of the broader themes of the portfolio, would those be helping with, with your goal? So if, if the fund is focusing on something like climate action, um, then that's probably going to be helping things like um, uh, things like animal well-being um, in 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 nature, um, and and then you know beyond that, I think a lot of your the impact that you're going to be making um, can be beyond your investments too. Uh, we've seen people look at their investments, look at their giving and philanthropy, kind of in the in a same sense, except you know giving philanthropy, you're not getting any any return uh financial return um and so you might be for certain types of values certain types of types of impact you might have to make your impact through philanthropy okay so i i've got it get really depends question here he actually was the first one to put a question down and it's a bit of a doozy for you um and so his question is eric nuttall recently wrote a wrote that generalist investors are missing the boat on Canadian energy stocks. Can you please comment on that? I actually read that article. Um, so I'll let you answer this because you're coming from um, a sustainability angle. But essentially what he was saying is that the positive outlook for oil is extremely strong right now. So um, maybe you could comment on 
investing in values in a cycle where um, perhaps energy stocks could do quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so again, this, this really depends on your values. Um, so everyone's going to have different values. Some people are okay with investing in oil and gas. Other people aren't okay with that. Um, if you are okay with that, you know, Genis does have conventional uh, funds as well. We don't just have sustainable funds. Um, and all, all of our, our models, our signals are showing that we should be overweight energy. Um, so our models are, are agreeing with that stance. And so in our conventional CanGlobe fund, in, in a lot of our conventional funds, we are overweight energy. Um, so if, if that's a place that you, that you want to be, um, then, then you can be overweight energy. Um, and certainly if, um, if you're investing in a Canadian fund, Genis has a Canadian high conviction fund or a Canadian alpha fund, um, then, then you're going to be overweight energy there and it's going to be, you're going to have Canadian energy. So you can certainly get that exposure if you want. Uh, but the more the more interesting side is is what do you do if you want to invest in a fossil free or a sustainable manner? And so in our fossil free funds, uh, we we do take out companies involved in fossil fuel, um, so we wouldn't have any Canadian energy in there. Um, but one of the key things that we do is that we invest in companies that are highly correlated with oil and gas, so we do get some exposure, uh, but we believe are going to be performing uh, probably better in the long run um, and are, are more values aligned, more importantly. Um, so there are certain industries like uh, information technology, consumer discretionary, um, some financials that are relatively correlated with oil and gas. So you still get that, that exposure. Um, and there's, there's certain um, geographies that are highly correlated with oil and gas. So Canada would be one, Australia would be another one where if you're investing in those geographies, then, um, then those companies, even if they're not in oil and gas, are probably gonna be going up when oil and gas is going up. Um, so you can get that exposure there. And so we actually have a divestment report that we published for, I think four years in a row, and we'll publish it again, probably coming this November, um, that actually shows that if you divest from oil and gas, and in, instead you fill that oil and gas gap with companies, industries, um, countries that are highly correlated with oil and gas, that you actually do outperform uh, the, the benchmark that includes oil and gas over the long run. Um, so divestment um, doesn't mean that you're having to give up returns. Um, it might mean that uh, you underperform in the short term, but in the long run, our back tests have shown that you've actually outperformed. Uh, and so we'll have another a report on that coming out probably this November. Um, so definitely watch out for that if you want more details. And so we have a lot of data backing up um, those statements. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I think I think you can either go directly, go for a conventional fund or or a fossil free fund and, and where we are investing in areas that are more um, oil and gas sensitive. Um, another question here. Um... Steve says he hasn't noticed much about ethical practices, treatment of workers, honesty, integrity with customers, et cetera. Um, did he miss this as a scoring factor? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So when we're measuring impact, um, it's, it's really hard to include everything. Those, those areas are extremely important, but we typically, uh, before we measure impact in our in our sustainable funds, we take out companies that are treating employees, communities, um, customers poorly. Um, so they're not even they're not even in these funds where we're measuring the impact. Um, so we have um, we have scores for um, how well a company treats a community. We have scores for um, employees. Um, uh, we have scores for how they they treat the environment and, and a bunch of underlying pillars of that as well. So it's not just these more high level scores and we're cutting out the, the bottom companies for these. And then we also look at controversies. So we look at companies that are involved in widespread or really severe controversies around communities that they're working in or around the environment or their employees. Uh, and we're cutting out those companies too. So we're not measuring that impact because those companies are already not in those portfolios. Um, 
And then when we're measuring impact, we're focusing more on the actual product rather than the operations of the company. So we're looking at the revenue that's generated by the product or service and how that's contributing towards sustainable towards a sustainable development goal. Of course, the operations of a company could be um, contributing or detracting as well, but we're trying to take care of that with the with the negative screening that we're doing. Davina has a, actually a really good question here. Well, lots of good questions, by the way. Um, do you have a conversation with companies that you've rated about their net impact? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, no, we haven't uh, we haven't been talking to them about their net impact score. I know that the underlying um, data providers do talk to the companies about the scores um, that they're that they're giving and the, uh, the the percentage of revenue that they're attributing towards uh, an impactful product, um, and also some of the other uh, environmental and social governance scores that they that they have uh, in their data. They're telling companies about it. Yeah, uh, but and no, actually, Genis uh, on, isn't directly in that vein, uh, talking vein. to companies. Um, does Genis stores. use That's any an interesting kind topic. of like um, firm to kind of further causes in terms of shareholder action? Hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So we partner with an organization called Share. Uh, so Share works mainly with nonprofit organizations, foundations, um, pensions. On, on engaging companies and helping them become uh, better at what they're doing. Um, so they might be engaging um, with, with a company trying to improve their environmental policy or maybe a policy related to a community that they're working in. Um, and so we work with Share uh, with the companies in our portfolio. We, um, we talk to them about what's important to us and what's important, uh, more importantly, to our clients um and and what we want them to further when it comes to engagement so right now the engagements that they're focusing on are our climate transition uh reconciliation um decent work uh and then also also um just general business ethics and making sure that uh, companies are getting better at that so they're frequently talking to management um they're writing letters and one of the big benefits of working with share rather than us doing it directly is that that Share has a team of about 25 professionals that are working full time on just engaging companies all the time. Uh, whereas for Genis, um, it would be hard to put that much that many resources towards this. Um, and then also they're combining the assets of all of their clients, um, and so they can have more influence with the company. Um, if if you're combining a bunch of pensions together, a bunch of foundations, asset managers then a bigger corporation is really okay, going to listen to you. Um, so I love this question. You know, trillions um, of dollars. Do we look into the ownership of companies? Actually, a long question, um, but this is kind of the type of question I would personally ask. Um, so I guess the example would be um, Purdue Pharma funds and opioid addiction clinic. Mm -hmm. Do we look into who is actually funding a company um, in terms of, scoring net impact scoring uh so we do look into ownership of a company if it is another publicly traded company um so if if one corporation is owning another company then we will look into that um so if we're if we're trying to stay out of a certain industry uh but a larger company owns a company in that industry, then we would stay out of that larger company in general. We're, we're not looking into uh, individual investors or, or you know, uh, an asset manager no, and looking at the ownership. Yeah, the way Adam put it is, is it seems like you're shaking hands with the devil, right? right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we do look so, into uh, it. I'm glad that, that we have account. some screens for that. Um, another question, how often do the companies that review impact for Genesis, uh, Sustainalytics, ETC, um, how often do yeah. they update their info? And um, how do we know that Genesis is getting the most current information? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we would love is if these data providers uh, 
uh, updated their information more frequently. Uh, but since they're trying to uh, measure impact, measure environmental social governance for thousands of companies, they don't update them um, on a weekly basis or anything like that. So there's certain parts such as controversies that they are updating quite frequently. Um, so we'll see changes even, even daily sometimes with the controversies, but with the overall environmental social governance scores, typically it's quarterly for some companies, some companies it could be every six months, um, but it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be something that's changing uh, very often. Um, but, uh, but if there is big new news, then that will come through um, quite quickly. Analytic like companies popping up where we're going to have access to more data. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot more companies that are popping up all the time. Uh, there's actually, you know, it's, it's quite a, a, a big business right now. Um, so there are companies um, and, and more frequently going through more data providers and, and trying to figure out if they would provide any more value for our clients. Um, so we've been looking through um, data providers that, that, um, that look through, um, that look through news reports for, for companies. Um, and they do this through um, AI that they've developed uh, and, and try and find controversies um, even faster than these other data providers. So they're looking through even social media, they're looking through, you know, the, you know, Twitter mentions of certain companies and seeing if there's any controversies. So things like that are quite interesting. There's other, other data providers that are, um, that are looking at some of this ESG data from kind of a different angle. Um, so that's quite interesting. And as we talked about before, diversity is, is really important to us. Yeah, I think so what I'm hearing data from you is, is really the data is only going to um, get so better from here. See different so that's angles good, that's good of, news for everyone. of a company and you can get a better overall picture. Okay, well, believe it or not, we actually got to all the questions, which is actually a minor miracle. Uh, we thank everybody for those yeah, questions. Yeah, exactly. Mike and I would like to thank you very much for taking the time, um, your valuable time wow. to attend the webinar both to our valued clients and those who are new to us. Um, we'd like you to join next month's seminar, which I just clicked past. Here it comes. There it is. Next, next month's seminar. It's going to be very good. Um, it's on family wealth and communication with our very own Grant Conroy with Michelle Ostro from uh, Deloitte. So please register for that if you can. It'll be quite good. Um, if you could, please stick around for a few more minutes as as soon as we close the session, you'll be redirected to a survey. We'd really like to know your thoughts and your feedback. Um, today's webinar will appear on our website um, in the next few days. So if you want to revisit it or if you want to send it to friends or family, please do so. We will be uh, emailing you um, a link to uh, very likely about renewing, uh, reweaving wealth, sorry, reweaving. Um, so the flashcard thing that we talked about earlier, we will send a link to that, I'm sure. And we also will let you know when the webinar has been posted. Thank you very much. We, much, we very much appreciate you spending time with us. Enjoy your day.